welcome back after that uh, very sentimental and historic event now we are moving to the next panel discussion uh, this is going to be again a very important panel discussion as far as apac is con concerned because apac is an academic consortium so now we are going to discuss the health research in the new normal how health research should be conducted and what are the challenges what is expected from the public health researchers and what are the specific situations and challenges related to the new normal so i would like to welcome my co-chair professor manoj veera singh who is professor in community medicine and a long standing member of apac and we have again an eminent panel including dr philip baker who is an expert in evidence based medicine and uh, dr nicholas low from taipei medical university professor bruce maycock and uh, dr naramon aminokol from uh, mahidol university maybe we can introduce one by one first and then move into a discussion this is going to be an informal panel discussion share in your ideas challenges and uh, what are your suggestions in moving forward so let's start with our coach Yes. Good morning to all of you and others who may be reaching the noon. So basically, what we are looking at here, as uh, Professor Indika was mentioning, is the times have come for us to do certain things in different ways. For example, in the health research, uh, generally, even in the hospital settings, we were talking to people. and doing things and investigations and so on on health research when it comes to public health research we are generally engaged with communities people in the field but now with this issue of the pandemic we find it very difficult to do things in the traditional way and now we need to find ways to do our research to engage with people engage with communities and engage with other sectors in different modes so it's a challenging time and i hope that uh, within this particular discussion we could shed some light on new ways of involving engagement in research beyond the normal traditional ways that we were used to do it so we will see how we can proceed in the next one hour or so yeah. thank you manoj now let's move into our first panelist again uh, mind you this going to be very informal panel discussion world wide so we are joining from uh, i think six countries at the moment so philip for your opening remarks so i'd like just to uh, build on uh, some of what um colin vince has just um um talk to us about um, some of the priorities and and where things have been headed how things are going what we've seen um over the last um, few years uh, is been an emphasis on uh, the burden of disease um research that's focused on priorities that come from the burden of disease whether it's whether we think of burden of disease um as data that uh, prevalence studies which tell us how, how big of a problem it is but more or is it more specific such as the burden of disease studies by Murray and Lopez and it's interesting they they published in 1996 um in science uh the burden of disease the dalis um lower respiratory infections was ranked 1 and their prediction for 2020 is that lower respiratory infections would uh, decrease down to a rank of 6 but we can understand now with covid um uh, that is some um, emerging as a, a problem but we can say that um these burden of disease studies have helped us in in prioritization um and we we can look at burden of disease studies not just globally but um often they've been done even um on more more local levels and for particular groups for example in queensland um there's um uh burden of disease studies done um, on the aboriginal population in queensland so 
of researchers um, kind of down there specifically. So what, 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 are, what are some of the public health priorities that have emerged um, from COVID? And one we can think about even the effect of the public health response itself, of people being put into quarantine, um, self-isolation, people being separated from their families. Uh, for example, in Queensland, in, in Australia, we've had hard borders between states for months and months. Um, fly and fly out workers have been away from their families. Um, loneliness in the, in the elderly, um, being locked down, staying at home, uh, being um, unable to go out and engage in physical activity. Uh, so it seems that these um, priorities, uh, the, the, um, the response itself is creating some, uh, some health problems that we um, need to look at. And um, also when we think about mask wearing, well, um, some people are arguing that um, it uh, creates some social disconnectedness. And we even think about the term social distancing. Um, probably that's an unhelpful term. Um, by just staying away from people. So what are some of the immediate effects of, um, of um, COVID? Well, we can say, well, obviously the immediate illness of people getting sick, um, being hospitalized. Um, there's some suggestions now that there will be ongoing um, problems with disability. Um, certainly uh, you can see that the number of deaths Urge um, high death rates, um, and perhaps this will change um, the population pyramids in some countries with um, very high rates of um, elderly people um, um, proportion amongst the elderly or even amongst um, the disadvantaged. And then also, you know, the, the financial impact if you're hospitalized um, and if you don't have um, health insurance that could bankrupt you. Um, and even, again, there's going to be issues around the aging population um, and risks for elder abuse, uh, particularly on financial abuse of the elderly as um, younger um, family members um, are eyeing the, um, the finances of the elderly. Um, so and that's certainly um, has been identified as uh, a, um, a potential issue. If we go further and we start thinking about, well, what type of research should be done? Well, we have the, um, uh, we understand the, um, the pyramid of evidence that we have um, lower, uh, like expert opinion, case control studies sitting on the lowest level of, of evidence and systematic reviews um, sitting on the top. Um, in terms of uh, public health, uh, this many of you familiar with the success framework, um, which is a different articulation, uh, but it's similar, um, suggesting that these um, again synthesis of single studies, um, um, a synopsis of single studies and synthesis all the way up to um, summaries, and then the incorporation of systematic review evidence into public health policies are sitting on the top. And there are certainly problems that we understand with primary studies um, and um, you know individual studies can be misleading and that's one of the key reasons why systematic reviews are so important, have been so important. This is very interesting um, that emerged a paper um, by Paul Glasio and um, Sanders and Hoffman uh, um, looking at waste in COVID research, uh, suggesting that um, uh, there is a waste in research that is emerging, so an imbalance in trial topics, an emphasis on non-drug interventions, where perhaps um, drug interventions be, um, have more biological plausibility, um, limited research on tra trials of masks, also, um, emphasis towards some preprints and irresponsible dissemination. We're even seeing, you know, the results of, um, of vaccine trials being released by um, industry through um, media releases. Um, 
Blasio points out, uh, flawed studies are being highly cited. And overall, there's been a lot of waste in research um, that's been ex exacerbated. Um, other papers have been published. Um, similarly, um, that is, um, Um, pointing out that um, there's, there tends to be um, more um, poor methodologically uh, quality in the results, particularly around um, hydroxychloroquine. And um, in a Carney and a paper that describes the carnage of substandard research um, that has occurred, and uh, another paper is pointing out to uh, concerns about low levels of evidence um, that are uh, being promoted. And here um, we have these figures like um, uh, Donald Trump telling us to take hydroxychloroquine, also injecting with um, um, disinfectants. Um, so um, we already have had this problem of Trumpism, I think, that has been infecting um, research. Um, so one of the thing, one of the ways forward is through systematic reviews. Um, but I think systematic reviews and evidence informed public health is under attack. Um, some universities have now no longer going to pay publishing fees for systematic reviews. Um, they don't count them as part of a, um, a PhD by publication. Some researchers feel persecuted for doing a systematic review. It's very difficult to fund systematic reviews, but. What we see is that there is systematic reviews do hold answers, but a big problem has been the politicizing of, um, scient of the scientific um, response in, in evidence, um, which I think is a big challenge that we need to um, address. It's interesting is that some of the evidence that's emerged from systematic reviews telling us what to do, particularly the Lancet paper, um, and I'll show you that in a moment, it actually corresponds to knowledge that we've had for thousands of years um, that has come from the Bible, um, such as um, people with um, a disease that can be um, um, through respiratory, um, uh, transmitted through um, uh, um, through aerosol um, suggests um, in Leviticus, it tells them that they must isolate, live outside the camp, wear a mask, um, specifies cover the lower part of the face, wash your clothes, wash yourself with hands, wash your hands with, um, with soap and cleaning powder. So um, I don't think that there is a, um, in terms of faith, um, people of faith should have confidence in science that uh, there is um, an overlap. There is, here we see a systematic review evidence um, pointing to physical distancing, mask wearing and eye protection. We understand it quite well. So systematic reviews, high level evidence is really important. But the challenge is um, there are some underlying challenges that's occurring. We've got universities that are losing the loss of income Funding agencies are de um, delayed in processing grant applications. Um, some feel that there's a loss of academic freedom um, by being pushed in to do other research that might generate um, funds. Um, people in public health have reported um, Trump-style managerial abuses in academia. And, um, and there is this potent risk now of, of insul being insular. Um, you know, no flights into Australia. We're not allowed to leave. You can't come in. Um, but partnerships are important. And I think we have to be careful of um, unhelpful, destructive, anti collaborative approaches like people um, um, mislabeling um, COVID 19. And, and again, this, you know, is um, um, evidence, you know, comes from um, articulations from Trump. Uh, so some of the, I think one of the key things here is that some of the things that we've already identified from burden of disease, such as physical inactivity, 
as a priority. It's probably gone worse um, during COVID-19 and therefore the research um, around what we can do, it's more, it's even more pressing matter than it has been before. And, um, and so this is a review that we did on community-wide interventions to increase physical activity. Um, it might be new community-wide programs might be looking a little bit different, to, um, but it's still very important. So this systematic review and other systematic reviews are really important. I think this, I like this comment about when we're thinking about, well, what research should we be doing and, and how should we do it? Um, Sir Muir Gray said 19th century health was transformed by clean, clear water. The 21st century health will be transformed by clean, clear knowledge. So that's, I think, is one of the really important things to be mindful of when we're looking at research priorities and approaches that we need to be generating clean, clear knowledge. Um, and some of the ways to do that is some, um, I would term stick to the knitting, stick to the knitting. And that is concentrate on areas familiar, that we're familiar with, um, that are um, priorities within the burden of disease, such as physical activity, sedentary behavior, obesity, tobacco addiction, mental illness. These are remaining a public health priority and they will likely be increasing. Um, Concentrate on the, um, the essentials of epidemiology and high quality research methods and can continue to strengthen the evidence base through systematic reviews. Um, implementation science um, will be um, continue to be important. And that is um, how we translate research findings into public health policies and also being able to change uh, people's behavior. We need to stay in collaboration. We need to build partnerships, um, continue those partnerships, continue to work together. I think those are the, the, uh, the challenges that we need to overcome with public health research. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Philips, uh, for this encouraging and uh, thought-provoking ideas that you contributed. And uh, now we would uh, invite Dr. Nicholas Lo from the Taipei Medical University, Taiwan, to actually uh, contribute and express your ideas on how are we going to go through these difficult times in public health research. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction from uh, Professor Inkar and uh, our chairman. Uh, it's very happy and glad to uh, join this panel discussion. Actually, uh, I'm uh, here to representing the Professor Betty uh, since uh, she has another important meeting and they cannot join our uh, discussion. So uh, here I would like to very briefly uh, share my viewpoint some of uh, from some of these viewpoints from uh, Professor Betty's recommendation and some of mine. And uh, actually, uh, my uh, presentation basically can be uh, classified into two parts. First is about the uh, international or global cooperation. Uh, secondly, it's much focused on the national or inside countries issues. For the uh, international cooperation, I think since uh, COVID-19 make a huge impact on our world, not only uh, health, but also industry, education, resource, or even environmental uh, exposure. All these domains were affected huge, hugely by uh, COVID-19 and make a significant change in response to the pandemic. So, uh, of course, including uh, the SDG plan, as you can see that many people have discussed uh, the potential impact of COVID-19, which may postpone the uh, progression of the SDG target. And we may need to reschedule a new reasonable target. But here I would also like to highlight the importance of the cooperation, including uh, interdisciplinary and international cooperation. 
For example, uh, scholars, the researchers from Taiwan, they have published uh, many papers to share our experience in combating COVID-19 and highlight the features of digital technology of prevention strategy. But I think very important thing is in the, in the next stage, uh, we have to uh, collaborate with each other between countries. For example, how to apply such kind of digital technology to develop prevention strategy in other countries, uh, given on the very uh, different uh, context, background, and culture. Therefore, I think uh, for such kind of uh, cooperation, uh, the app have could be a very great platform to exchange opinions and share our experience with each other and collaborate with each other. It is very important to understand why Taiwan so far reaches these results, but not other neighbor countries. Even we have performed a similar policy or intervention strategy. Also, uh, Taiwan will learn from other countries via this uh, discussion and opinion exchange process. And uh, next part is about the uh, individual. For the individual level, uh, we know that COVID-19 also make a huge impact on personal behavior. Uh, for example, the sanitary behavior, also the lifestyle, exercise, dietary, and even the healthcare seeking behavior, social behavior, or even environmental exposure. All of these behaviors could be very different from previous, the last year's data. But we don't know how much of this impact in terms of the behavior change. We have to perform the uh, comprehensive investigation, for example, the national representative survey to evaluate and uh, quantify the behavior change of the population. This is a key step to develop a uh, effective intervention strategy. Here I will, I would also uh, want to echo the uh, Professor Becker's comment in terms of the uh, burden of disease. Here we can see that all of these behaviors change. Uh, a lot of them are related to the non communicable disease development. Therefore, uh, if we want to develop this related uh, policy or intervention strategy, we have to know the current situation, then we will have the idea and uh, to develop a suitable plan to improve the disease prevention. On the other hand, uh, one of the most important things we learn from COVID-19 is about health inequality. According to uh, the study and the evidence, they show that the risk of a severe outcome and the death in COVID-19 infected patients is increased among uh, individuals with uh, poor general health and uh, poor nutrition status. And among those with underlying chronic conditions, uh, such as cardiovascular disease, lung disease, diabetes, and cancer, and uh, also the obesity, of these non-communicable disease conditions is inversely uh, associated with social economic status. Also, uh, the health seeking behavior uh, related to the health literacy and uh, access to uh, health care, which uh, could be influenced by poor uh, social economic status. And the main uh, delayed uh, the seeking care for COVID-19. All of these potentially uh, resulting in more uh, severe disease and bad outcome. Therefore, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has exposure uh, how uh, health inequality can affect people, not in a, a whole lifetime, but also in a very few uh, weeks or few months. This, uh, this inequality in the social determinants of health, such as poverty and healthcare access, affecting a wide range of health outcomes and the quality of life and even the risk of disease. This uh, pandemic has amplified the underlying uh, inequality in society. Uh, therefore, we should tackling this uh, social cause of 
health inequality is even more urgent. Uh, and I think uh, across government sectors or even all parts of government and the public uh, service uh, sectors, they have need to cooperate with each other and uh, try to reduce health inequality and put this as the high, uh, uh, highest uh, priority. Also, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the topic is related to the digital technology. Uh, we know that di digital technology uh, are being widely uh, used to support the uh, public health response to uh, COVID-19, uh, including population surveillance, case identification, uh, contact tracing, and uh, communication with the public. This uh, response may need to uh, link billions records um, from mobile phones, uh, large online uh, data sets, and apply the maybe uh, the machine learning or natural language processing. In Taiwan, we have demonstrated how we uh, utilize the digital technology to strengthen the COVID-19 uh, epidemic prevention by developing the data linkage model. For example, uh, we have the uh, travel history tracking, uh, tracking uh, system. Uh, in this system, they provide a real-time alarm to uh, healthcare providers and to uh, especially the frontline health worker to help them to um, identify the potential uh, test. Uh, potential COVID-19 test. Also, we have this uh, name-based math uh, rationing system for general public uh, to uh, purchase the adequate uh, math uh, and avoid the uh, unnecessary panic. We also uh, established, as you can see that in this figure, uh, we established a pandemic prevention system from broader to community. And uh, everyone entry into Taiwan, we have a series uh, quarantine and uh, traveling tracking system and to prevent the uh, possibility of the outbreak of uh, COVID-19. Such a uh, digital technology application will be formed a new, uh, will be formed a part of a new normal. Uh, no matter government or any organization, they need to adapt a new uh, digital technology system during the pandemic and they think about how to normalize these new practices. And these uh, new technology-driven work practices are usually implemented during the uh, most severe time under highly pressured conditions and often uh, without the former uh, experience or training. Therefore, I think Taiwan's uh, experience can be considered as a valuable reference for other countries to better understand how uh, digital technology can be embedded in within uh, the government practice and form the new normal in this um, post uh, COVID COVID nineteen era. Also, uh, such kind of data linkage uh, system uh, will provide opportunity to perform the research beyond traditional uh, epidemiology study. For example, when we uh, reopen these uh, economic activities step by step. We may need a real-time surveillance modeling to uh, calculate the potential risk of any uh, opening policy and to detect the potential uh, repose. But uh, in addition to apply the digital technology on uh, communicable disease, on um, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but also uh, we found that in this uh, pandemic, which also pushed the healthcare system, uh, rapidly implemented the new tools, especially technology based, to allow the healthcare to be delivered when uh, physical contact is uh, not possible. So, uh, such digital tools in healthcare is undergoing a substantial and rapid shift. We can expect that uh, technology will um, most likely change healthcare system over the next few years. 
with a very uh, quick step. Uh, for example, uh, you can think that uh, uh, there are a lot of people have the smartphone and uh, wearable device. And all of these devices will collect a lot of these uh, data and information uh, within a very short time. But how to utilize such kind of information? Also, uh, for example, the at home, at home uh, or portable diagnostic tools or a smart drug deliver mechanism, uh, digital therapy or uh, virtual reality technology of these Technology would provide a new uh, insight or uh, new uh, practice of this uh, research development. So uh, I think uh, this pandemic also has uh, accelerated the shift of digital transformation. It also raised the uh, potential issue about the balance between uh, disease prevention and the private protection. So the data have been uh, ethically used uh, for uh, improving uh, population health and not violate personal benefits. That's a very important question when we uh, perform uh, such kind of uh, research. Anyway, uh, I think that we have to grasp the trend in, the, in advance and catch up with this opportunity, especially for uh, the interpretation of the big data analysis. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. Uh, now, uh, let's look at this in a slightly different and maybe uh, in a maybe somewhat controversial way, I think, because uh, Professor Bruce Maycock, uh, he want to look at this link between the two new normal and pH public health research and the challenges in a somewhat different way and that's what Bruce is well known to. Bruce, over to you. Thank you, Indika. Um, it sounds a little ominous that um, I might be uh, doing this in a slightly controversial way. So um, for those who uh, are expecting slides, I don't have any slides. And um, so you'll just have to, to listen intently. So the point of this topic is about public health research in the new normal. But I just want to reiterate, what are some of the changes that we've already had to public health and this idea of new normal? So let's just pause there for a second. Colin told us just a moment ago that public health is about the promotion of health and well-being protecting communities from disease and injury. And he emphasized the issue about communities where we live, where we play. And it's not just about surviving, it's about being able to thrive. And let's come on to this idea of normal. We're throwing around a term, new normal. Normal is about conforming to a standard. It's about doing what's usual, typical, expected. And when you think about what we, and I'm using we as a collective to the public health and also other organizations that are involved in the health space, we are asking populations to transition to this new state of interaction. And that interaction is things about, for example, social distancing, the way we touch, the way we greet, how often we wash our hands, whether we wear a mask or don't, where we work, how we work, whether we can exercise in public, whether we can move as a family to the shops, or whether it's one person that's allocated from the family that can leave the home. All of these things are about the interaction. And we're asking people for compliance. This is the new normal we're asking for, for using apps to allow tracking, etc. We're asking people to work differently to school differently. And these have impact upon income and opportunity. And the reason we're asking this is to protect, we're for, uh, protect and prevent infection. And yet in some areas in our communities, these very things are going to exacerbate existing inequalities to the point where we're actually threatening the existence of some families. 
But we want them to thrive, not just survive. So we may be asking for a new normal, but we already know that this compliance with these requests is not universal and that there are many social, cultural and other factors that are just as important as science and the medical condition. In my state, in Western Australia, we only have a death rate of three per million, which is compared just slightly over three per million, which compared to the rest of Australia, which is sitting at 35 per million, is substantially lower. So for us, we haven't had community transmission for a long time. And our behavior change that we can observe in Western Australia is very different from what's been asked. And it's an example of those social cultural conditions. I actually propose we are not in a new normal. We don't have a new normal yet. We're in a crisis of transition. You know, we're in a transitional crisis, if you want, where we're trying to change behavior. And that as people hear the vaccine is emerging, many of these places where we have new behaviors will eventually evaporate unless there is very strong evidence that is, and it's culturally appropriate evidence for regarding compliance with what we're asking for, and that that evidence is transmitted to different populations in ways in which they value and respond to. So this is some of that background. What COVID has done for us though, is it has, it has expanded our reliance and our acceptance of technology. It's also facilitated new ways of working, particularly for those in middle and higher income in countries. Those in lower income spaces, those people employed in lower income positions often don't have that same level of flexibility granted to them. And so here again, we see COVID automatically opening up evidence of inequality. Now for those researchers, you've already been given ideas in this presentation already of 20 or 30 new areas that we could be looking at for research um, priorities. So technology has contributed to allowing us to continue our connection to tracking, to monitoring and contacting. But COVID has also highlighted existing inequalities, particularly in areas like housing, you know, overcrowding, lack of facilities for bathing. It's highlighted inequalities in relation to employment. That's casual, that's insecure, that's poorly paid. And it's negatively impacted upon those in those situations because they have limited social and capital resources. And so they are not only the most marginalized, the most impacted, but also then become one of the groups most at risk and then there is the potential that they become further victimized because we identify them as potential hotspots, contagion areas for COVID. Now to come back to the topic of research, public health research in this new novel, which as you know, I now don't agree with that term. And when COVID hit, I was particularly worried about what the consequence would be. And I have to agree with Philip in a relation to sticking to the knitting, i.e. don't forget the communicable diseases. Don't forget the maternal and child health issues. And agreeing with both um, Philip and with Nicholas regarding the focusing on health inequality as COVID has really amplified these things. When COVID hit, I was worried about my capacity to do research in the region. Out of my doctoral's capacity, doctoral students capacity to even collect their data. I want to just give you one little example. So one of my students was collecting data. So she had a community based intervention that was collecting data around sexual attitudes, behaviors and experience of men who have sex with men and why RIA, which we might also understand is not quite an exact um, definition, but a bit like transgender, um, so um, transgender tran um, individuals. 
And she was trying to collect this data with interviews, with focus groups, and then with cross-sectional survey of over 350 people with MSM or Wairia, identifying as MSM or Wairia. She was locked down in Western Australia and unable to travel to Indonesia to collect her data. And yet, with social media and with the capacity to connect to communities, she was able to collect all of the data using the same methods that we just had to modify the way in which they were actually done. She could still run focus groups. She could still do interviews. And she was still able to recruit people to get a good quality recruitment of 450 people with Wairia, identifying as Wairia or MSM. So my point here is that the research methods might change slightly. But in actual fact, some of the experience with technology shows that we can adapt to that. COVID has drowned out other issues and we can't let that to occur. And Nicholas highlighted that even the progress on SDGs may actually not progress the way in which we would like. But there are lessons here from COVID in relation to the SDGs, because what COVID has highlighted is it's really brought under the spotlight, made us focus on many of those things, those pre-existing weaknesses that were already delaying our progress on SDGs, particularly issues around employment and opportunity and existing inequality. Before COVID hit, Australia experienced the worst bushfires it had ever had. We lost a total of 186,000 square kilometres. To put that into context, that is the whole of England and the whole of Wales being burnt in total. It is over half of Japan being burnt in total. And these fires were to a large deg degree exacerbated by climate change. And while people don't want to hear of this during this period, because we're focusing on the COVID crisis, for me, this is still the threat that we still have to face, and one which actually will require a global new normal, but one for which there is substantial resistance. I'm going to stop there because otherwise we won't move to the discussion. But I hope that just highlights a couple of the issues which I think still need further um, consideration. So, as expected. Uh, so, thank you, Bruce, for highlighting the challenges and the fact that we are st still struggling to achieve the new normal. So, that also could be another area for research. Okay. Now we'll be moving to Thailand and that's the Dr. Narumon Hominikul from the Mahidol University, Thailand, uh, who is quite experienced with public health research, especially in the field of nursing. Uh, or to you, Mona. Okay, um, it's very honor to be here today and um, special thanks for Professor Idiga who um, invited me to this session. It's very honor and I'm really excited to um, sharing my experiences with you guys all. So the topic today is about public health new normal and research. So if we talk about the research, I think we cannot uh, avoid in talk about new normal first and then uh, come up with the research for like uh, currently research or a future research for new normal. The situation in Thailand for uh, the new normal um, is that uh, we, are, we are not getting used to, I mean, in the past, we are not getting used to the facial masks, we are not getting used to the um, alcohol gel. Uh, for the people who graduate from abroad, they will have the alcohol gel for their uh, belonging, their personal belonging. That's always the must item. But for Thailand citizens, we are not um, get familiar with facial masks, and also we are not get familiar with alcohol gel. 
So um, it's become new normal after the COVID outbreak in Thailand that uh, a must-have item that everyone needs to have, which turned to be the must-have item, which is a facial mask and um, upper moisture. So it's turned to be a social responsibility to keep wearing masks for um, prevention. And uh, for the WHO, it's called uh, count as the long-term immunity, which is uh, we have uh, I, we have to um, inform the citizen, I mean Thailand citizen, that um, wearing um, facial masks always will be the long-term immunity. Anyway, the people with illness, especially respiratory infections, who omit to wearing masks in public would face a social stigma and social sanction both directly and indirectly. Both directly, they may face some conflict with another uh, citizenship who keep wearing the mask because they show their social responsibility. But indirectly, um, social sanction or social stigma is that they keep sparing those who are not comply with the social responsibility by not keep wearing masks in you know, public. So this is the uh, this become the new normal for Thailand citizens, but it's not um over or for Thai citizens because mostly uh people who comply with the social responsibility by keep wearing masks is in the capital city like Bangkok or uh, in the uh, big city. So in the rural area, they still don't understand why they need to keep wearing masks when they go to the mall or even for um, shop. And uh, that made the problem happen and uh, confronting each other. So that is the new normal that happened in Thailand. And another thing is alcohol, just like I mentioned before, that uh, it is another a must-have item. The handy personal alcohol gel and, and alcohol spray is become the very necessary item that we need to uh, keep it with yourself always. And also keep everything clean before you get into your house, something like that. So it's become very common. Uh, but again, for uh, those with high education and also those who can afford to buy um, alcohol and also those who uh, afford to buy uh, the mask. So we still have, um, how to say, the uh, disparity, both uh, social and economic disparity. Um, because of uh, the high education person or the high socioeconomic people, they uh, have, um, how to say, they will have uh, uh, ability to, um, to buy, to buy those um, must have items. So they keep it uh, and buy it a lot. That make it become shortage and not accessible for those who are in low socioeconomy. And it's at the first time when a COVID outbreak has begun, the price is really high. It's like sky high. But uh, later on, um, the government uh, try to make the sanction by make the price lower and they even designate unusable i mean reusable masks made from fabric or made from projects like uh, this picture that the prime minister tried to uh, send it to every uh, family members in thailand but unfortunately it's only one person per each which is not enough for the poor community. 
for physical distancing or what we call social distancing um, uh, according to the WHO uh, instead of calling social distancing we should call physical distancing because it's obviously that uh, it means that uh, from one person to another person. But anyway, because of uh, our culture in Asia, especially for uh, Thailand citizen, we have the culture of uh, why, just like the picture of a little, a little girl at the right hand side, to uh, pay respect or greeting when we see each other. So we don't we don't shaking hand or we don't hug or we don't kiss. But uh, recently, um, the westernized um, breathing become uh, familiar in Thai culture as well. So we have to come back to our way of respect by why to greeting uh, people instead of hug, kiss and shaking hand. But anyway, for uh, the slum or crowded community or underserved community like homeless, labor community or migration community still has some limitation in terms of wearing masks. Just like I mentioned before that there are very low income and low society and even low education so that uh, they cannot afford to uh, wear masks and also they cannot avoid to uh, physical distancing because of the crowded community. It limits them to uh, be together in the crowded uh, home or in the crowded community like this. So this is one of um, the uh, barrier for new normal in Thailand but uh, we keep educate them and right now it turned to be that everyone accept that we need to wear masks in public and also we keep physical distancing. For the research that um, unfortunately I um, can only share my uh, my experiences during my um, my uh, no new normal of COVID that uh, I try to just like Professor Bruce mentioned that um, in this COVID period uh, it's not easy for us to um, asking for grant or funding for research especially for the research that is not um, is not a related with COVID uh, issues something like that so actually, I proposed the research proposal about AN health disparity for homeless adolescents because I realized that those with homeless adolescents or those with homeless people cannot access to um, a, a must-have item, just like I mentioned before. So I proposed AN health disparity for homeless adolescents by uh, using mobile uh, application system for the service. But still, uh, it's stuck with the process of the submitting the proposal because the COVID um, research proposal must be the first priority for the, for the government right now. So this one, uh, I think maybe I have to reshape again and submit it again. And because we uh, have a lot of migration from uh, from Myanmar, especially for the, the labor from Myanmar, which is uh, kind of being in the crowded community that they cannot avoid. So that uh, one of my students and our research team um, doing the research about the hygiene behavior among Myanmar workers in uh, seafood processing industry in Samukratan province, which is the province where there is a lot of migration and uh, for, for uh, being the labor in, 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 in Thailand. The suburb area around um, Bangkok is a suburb area where the uh, migrant worker work in there. So that we just want to know that what about the hygiene behavior 
the recent result of this study found that the hygiene behavior among them is quite uh, from moderate to high because of the sanitary that the, uh, the industry provide them. But anyway, they cannot keep social distancing because of the crowded of the community that is limitation of social distancing. And uh, the new normal that uh, Thai citizens, the whole country, need to do and compliance for the government uh, compliance on government occupation, which is called Thai Chana. Thai mean Thailand. Chana in Thai mean uh, victory or win. So that Thai Chana is created by the government for uh, tracing um, spreader system in the whole country. So when you check in and check out for the public space, for example, shopping mall, church, temples, possibly, or uh, etc. You need to check in by Chai Chana and check out from Chai Chana because when, we check, when you check in, the information will be there for the government and also when you check out, you will need to evaluate the uh, public space or um, for example, uh, shopping mall that uh, whether or not they keep clean, whether or not uh, people inside the mall keep wearing masks or something like that. So you have the chance to evaluate uh, that uh, specific uh, public space that you're visiting. So before uh, entrance to the uh, public space uh, for shopping mall, for instance, uh, it's very normal now that you need to uh, check in by Chai China application first. Otherwise, the security that will not let you in and you keep wearing masks, otherwise he will uh, not letting you in. There is the news that there is a confrontation between the customer and the security guard in the mall because the um, uh, customer don't want to wear the uh, mask and she claimed that she is a very famous person in Thailand. So that's become the really um, funny uh, news for Thailand. But anyway, um, in uh, the new normal, we need to check in uh, with the Thai China application, wearing masks, otherwise you need to buy it because uh, every mall they will have the, the uh, face mask. Um, mm, so sell it for you if you don't wear it inside. And um, the thermometer check is really normal. Cleaning regulation in the mall, otherwise the mall will be closed if the evaluation is not satisfying the government. And also the uh, alcohol gel will have to be easy access in everywhere and every shop in the mall. So this is uh, the new normal for Thailand citizen. Uh, that is an uh, application for the government that uh, require every Thai uh, citizen to check in and check out every time in the public health, uh, in the public space. But for our faculty, faculty of public health, we have our Sabaidi board. Sabaidi is mean, um, uh, you have, do you have a good health today? Something like that. Bot is mean uh, robot. So Sabaidi so uh, application is the, our partic participatory solar land system supported by National Innovation Agency and prototype from Boston Children's Hospital. So uh, our dean uh, is the one, Adit Chinuan Tong is the one who initiates this uh, application to use in our uh, faculty um, area. So that uh, you need to check in with this by the bot application when you uh, come to work. And if you can see from the slide, uh, that is the, uh, that this one, um, this one is the way you need to um, report your health status. The first one, the second one is that um, you need to report uh, 
when that you um, go to the mall or something like that. And this one is the history of your contact um, in public or the history of your illness. So actually you need to report the temperature daily. And also you can see from the map uh, around your area that whether or not you live in the risky area that have the COVID people live together. In the red mark, uh, it will show that that area is the area that you should avoid being in crowding. So this is the application for our um, faculty cohorts. And our faculty is aligned with Thai government policies because uh, Mahidon University policy is to facilitate Thais to become healthless society. And our Dean um, Chen Yuan Tong is the one who initiated the Faculty of Public Health, which means to be health literate faculty. Uh, in the slide, you can see that uh, behind Dean Chen Yuan Tong, there is a uh, uh, health literacy um, protocol or health literacy step that uh, we need to uh, comply. And also we want to be a healthy uh, literate faculty. And uh, so everything in our faculty will be uh, health literate faculty. And right now, Dean Chen Wan Chong also uh, extend from uh, faculty of health, health literacy to be health literate community, which is a really good role model for uh, Thailand as a whole, because this is the first uh, model in Thailand. It's called Sung Nen uh, Wellbeing Model, which is uh, applying the concept of health literacy in uh, the community to promote the community and family members for health assessment and prevention. So that uh, at first it may be uh, Focusing on NCD, but right now, um, Professor Sunyo Chen Wan Tong, which is the Dean of Faculty of Public Health, she uh, tried to integrate with uh, the outbreak of communication disease, especially for COVID-2, because uh, people with NCD, especially elderly person, is susceptible to uh, COVID um, risky more than uh, normal healthy people. So uh, in Thailand, we also have the special, uh, how to say, special healthcare personnel, which is called community health volunteers, which I think that is quite unique when compared with another country, because our, in our country, we have community health volunteer to taking care of uh, the responsibility, uh, responsibility area or catching area around them so that the community health volunteer and effective pandemic outbreak monitoring need to be enhanced for community surveillance, including using the technological um, stuff or uh, we should uh, enhancing the digital literacy for health promotion as well, because right now uh, in uh, even rural area, area that can easy access to a mobile application, which is called Line application. So our uh, community health volunteer, they normally will um, connect each other by using Line application. And during the COVID outbreak, there is uh, the very significant uh, healthcare personnel staff that uh, can monitor people from risky area. For example, me, uh, I am working in faculty of public health in Bangkok. When I go back to Lampang province, which is in another a safe area, because Bangkok at that time is a risky red area. When I go back to my uh, hometown, the first team who come to me is community health volunteers. So community health volunteer is the one who get very closer to the community. So every single um, healthcare system uh, in Thailand, which is uh, success, successful, uh, we cannot uh, refuse that it's come from community health volunteers. And uh, in, in our 
normal, I mean, not new normal, in our normal life previously, we focusing on the health promotion of already. So that now we become more and more a concern about health promotion and health literacy because um, uh, even though we are in normal life, we are trying to do health promotion, but for the COVID crisis, it's become more and more concern and uh, imperative in terms of health literacy and health promotion. Not only non-communicable uh, disease, but also the outbreak of uh, um, communication disease, just like um, COVID, uh, including smoking and tobacco or uh, alcohol cessation. Because uh, if the citizens keep smoking or keep uh, having the habit of alcohol consumption, is prone to uh, get uh, COVID infection more easier. So that. Um, is a challenge and is an opportunity for us to bring up uh, this smoking cessation and alcohol cessation again to this COVID period of new normal. And also from the COVID uh, period and also after that, I mean, right now uh, we become new normal. Uh, it's more prevalent in mental health problem, for example, anxiety, depression, suicidal stigma, and violence, because uh, some people they uh, fail to get, uh, fail to keep uh, the career, so they have faced with the economic uh, in their family, so that anxiety, depression, suicidal, and stigma and violence is become more prevalent. From my um, research team, uh, we we concern about mental health of the citizen, especially for the uh, marginalized people or the vulnerable people. So that uh, during that that uh, COVID and also um, uh, this new normal period. We are conducting the intimate partner violence victims and health problems among men who have sex with men in Bangkok, Thailand. And just like Professor Bruce mentioned that uh, collecting the data during the COVID um, period is not easy because uh, we, because of the social distancing and also because of the work from home uh, policy. So that um, normally we use the questionnaire directly um, asking for the participant, but right now we need to come up with the Google form or uh, another digital uh, instrument instead to collecting the data. And also uh, because of the time of the COVID, we have the shortage of uh, um, healthcare personnel. So that is become more prevalent about uh, violence victim among uh, nursing professional and also another uh, healthcare team professional in emergency room, especially in community hospital where people can uh, uh, use the service or get close to the uh, get close to the community the most, so that the violence uh, become more prevalent among uh, nursing professional at that time, and we conduct this research. And um, right now, because uh, we are concerned about the uh, quality of emergency medical service among emergency medical responder during the COVID and also uh, the new normal for, uh, um, for more faster or more quality um, the referral system. So that our proposal now is to study about the quality of uh, emergency medical service among uh, emergency medical responder. Hopefully that we will get the grant. And also, um, Another health promoting um, school need to be upskilled. We in Thailand, I don't know about another another um, context, another cultural, uh, I mean, another country context, but in Thailand context, we have a uh, uh, health promoting hospital and we have health promoting school and health promoting school is need to be upskilled to be health literate school. And our faculty by Dean Shinwantong uh, also um, 
make uh, the network and uh, come up with the guideline of health literacy school. So um, it's all related to COVID and also another NCD. Just like my uh, doctoral student, she uh, do the research about the development of heart specialty program between school and family to prevent obesity among school and students, which is uh, preventing the NCD from the very beginning. So um, we cannot uh, refuse that the a new normal come up with the digital disruption. Um, digital disruption is something that we can learn very, very fast in very short period of time, uh, including uh, lecturer or student or parent because we need to work from home. So um, digital disruption and work from home or online course become um, fasting more than uh, we, 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 we thought. So work from home and learning from home culture is become our new normal. And because of the digital um, disruption and we need to work from home and learn from home and we use online class and uh, normally we will uh, get in touch by uh, using uh, technological uh, communication. So it come up with so many um, uh, cyber bullying citizenship so that uh, my student come up with uh, um, investigating the mechanism of cyber bullying among Thai adolescents during that period of time. And it's turned to be that um, it's high prevalent of cyber bullying among Thai adolescent victims a lot. Um, another new normal is that because we work from home policy and learn from distance learning so that uh, the what we have seen for a start from COVID period and right now it's become new normal is that the logistic delivery for food or uh, what we call food delivery and logistics system. So that this one is supposed to be something that is quite challenging for public health research because uh, we keep distancing, we keep physical distancing, we keep wearing masks, but once we use this logistic delivery food uh, service, we, we can see from the slide that there is no uh, social distancing among them who do deliver the food for us. And also there is uh, no wearing masks, uh, some, some wearing, but some not. So this is another challenge. Yeah, maybe my time is about to talk to, um, <laughs> okay, Dr. Indika, I will make it faster. Um, for this, the, for digital, so disruption, we are forced to fasten health innovation and more, uh, especially for mobile health. So my student is doing the proposal about the mobile application for stroke prevention for of the uncontrolled blood pressure, which is uh, we are um, um, expected to get uh, the, the funding. And also, it's fastened the online education or tele-education, which uh, Mahidon University, we have a lot of online class and we need to um, make it faster by branding uh, the learning and also um, uh, make the module for uh, make uh, the graduate faster. And also we have another, um, so many um, channel like a uh, spot on small private online course and massive online course. And uh, more, important, more importantly, we have Coursera, which will save uh, the time for the student to go abroad and study so that they can uh, just keep some certificate and get some credit. Uh, and accumulation the uh, credit to earn the, the degree from another from another university uh, that is a top university in uh, in in the world. And student new normal in in our in our faculty we have the um, the link that we would like to show you, but because of the time being, so I will skip this part. 
and uh, because of the digital disruption we need urgent digital literacy anyway because um, so many parents at home that, that don't know about the digital or online class but they have to control their, their child um, uh, learning from home or something like that and also the infrastructure transformation and support especially for blue collar community who cannot access or afford to both hardware and software facility is still needed. Uh, the challenge for public health is that uh, public health is supposed to be a change agent, raising public awareness, translation and media advocacy, promote health literacy and raising social engagement to improve social responsibility. And this is my um, uh, future research that uh, I think that there is um, around four uh, uh, for group that is uh, behavioral group, uh, health system group, and digital and vaccine equipment group. That is the future research that new normal should be. So last but not least, you can see that I just got it from my uh, cohort that uh, now they have the sign when they, you uh, entrance to the mall that avoid touching men <laughs> instead follow the woman. Avoid touching men is that avoid uh, touching mouth, avoid touching eyes, avoid touching nose. Instead, follow the woman is that follow the uh, washing your hands, obey social uh, distancing, mask up, exercise and eat well. And lastly, no unnecessary crowding. So that is not all of my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mona. So, uh, so in many areas that where a large amount of data can be collected and a lot of research could be done. Now, uh, I would invite Professor Manoj to make the concluding remarks and some of the discussion. Or to you, Manoj. Uh, thank you, Indika. What uh, I would like to just to show in the, just few minutes, looking at the continuum from pre-COVID, COVID that we are facing, to the post-COVID situation. I think there are two areas that we need to highlight and uh, think about as all four of our presenters uh, were talking about. The traditional ways that we were thinking of research in the pre-COVID si situation and the struggle that we are actually going through at the moment in the COVID situation and what would be the discourse in the post-COVID situation. I find two areas that we need to concentrate. One is the research agenda that we propose from pre-COVID now coming into COVID and the post-COVID. Second one, in pursuing this research agenda, what are the methodologies that we could adopt and design and reinvent to go into the post-COVID situation. As I understand the basic uh, research priorities we had before last December have drastically changed during the last 9 to 10 months period, which was highlighted by all three or four of our presenters previously, how things have changed. The issue is in a one year or two years time, when we go to a post-COVID situation, will it be the same as pre-COVID or have we gone somewhere or drifting towards a new situation on research, particularly in public health? Will it be the same lines of thinking that we will have as pre-COVID, the same way of engaging communities in public health research or will it be more technically advanced methods that we are going to use? So these discussions we have to wait and see, but my proposal here is that the good things that have, we have looked at from the pre-COVID situation and the new innovations that comes in the COVID situation has to be blend and take the best to the post-COVID situation. The research agenda should whatever benefit the mankind in the future to solve the immediate and long-lasting problems that we have in the public health and this agenda should actually finally benefit 
the common man in the ground. That is what APAC is for and that is why the public health practitioners are working for. Therefore, what I want to say at last is that from academic consortium of public health of the Asia Pacific as us, we need to think bit seriously on how the future landscape of public health research should be geared. And what contributions from all our members, all our countries, all our institutions could actually contribute towards this landscape for the future and how can we collaborate on those to develop new research methodologies to test those and to make sure that the best is retained for the post-COVID situation. So this is my final uh, understanding of the thing. And the priorities that we had earlier may have changed, but we have to look at the basic issues that we have are still undergoing from the pre-COVID situation, major public health issues. I think we should not uh, divert our focus from those just because we have challenged by a COVID situation. So, uh, good uh, uh, afternoon to all of you at the moment. And I think uh, I think uh, the symposium we were able to give some insights to people, and also we were able to raise many questions, which we do not have, still have answers for us to really deliberate on. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Yes. So basically, what uh, this symposium has done is generated a lot of areas where there are questions and where there are a lot of need for research and the possible challenges. With that, we come to the end of the panel discussion. And I thank all the resource persons, Philip, Nicholas, Bruce, and Mona for their insightful presentations and my co-chair, Praswanuj. <laughs>